Um, let's welcome Jonathan Kaftan, who's come raced over from uh, Green Mary, just up the road. Um, Jonathan's a variationist sociolinguist right. who specialises on French and languages of France. Yeah. So presumably endangered. Yeah, to on that end of the spectrum, yeah. that's right, yeah. Um, and the talk today is the new speaker as agent of social and linguistic change. No, thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, so in this paper, I'll be reporting on some of the findings that emerged from my PhD on language variation and change in uh, Franco-Provençal speaking communities, uh, in, uh, predominantly in Le Mans du Lyonnais and the Canton of Valley in Switzerland. Uh, like many of the regional languages and ancestral dialects spoken in these regions, the evidence coming from traditional native speakers suggests that convergence with standard French has been underway for some time. However, this paper will also consider so-called new speakers, a type of speaker perhaps not familiar to some here, given uh, your very own Julius Alabank's work on uh, the island of Guernsey. So uh, similar to the Guernsey context, but a number of, a number of other contexts, such as uh, Breton and Galician, new speakers of Franco-Provençal have begun emerging in traditional Franco-Provençal speaking communities. And today I'll be shedding some light on how they might be driving linguistic change and at the same time preventing complete language shift towards uh, standard French. I therefore propose the following presentation outline. I'll begin by giving an overview of this much understudied language before introducing some theoretical considerations. In particular, I'll focus specifically on the concept of the new speaker as it's understood in the current body of sociolinguistic literature before outlining the context of Franco-Provençal. We'll then consider the data that have come from fieldwork that uh, I undertook in uh, between July and uh, September 2012 for my PhD. So to begin, for those unfamiliar with it, uh, Franco-Provençal is a highly fragmented Romance dialect grouping spoken traditionally in parts of France, Switzerland, and Italy. Uh, diaspora communities are also reported to maintain uh, dialects of Franco-Provençal as, as a heritage language in parts of Canada and the USA too, and uh, Naomi Nagy at the University of Toronto is your port of call there. Uh, in general, the grouping is very fragmentary and is made up of a large number of varieties, 400 by some estimations, uh, with highly localized phonological, morphosyntactic, and lexical forms. And mutual intelligibility between these varieties is a matter of some debate. However, a number of internal groupings are traditionally recognized, such as uh, Lyonnais or Savoyard in France, uh, Valaisan or uh, Fribourgeois in uh, Switzerland, and the Val d'Autun uh, varieties in the autonomous region of the Aosta Valley. Now, no one dialect has traditionally held sufficient regional prestige for a dominant variety to emerge. There is no standard Franco-Provençal, as it were, and the Franco-Provençal region has never known any political or linguistic unity of any real kind. In terms of remaining speaker numbers, vitality, uh, numbers have been in decline for some time as language shift in the direction of uh, regionally more dominant varieties takes place. Obviously, we have a context here where Franco-Provençal is not in contact with just one dominant language, but several, and uh, regional varieties that have some higher prestige as well, such as Occitan, and in some cases, Piedmontais. Uh, in France, speaker numbers are largely uh, best guessed, as France holds no national census data collection for linguistic repertoires, given that everyone speaks French, why would they need to? Uh, but there's a general consensus that between 50 to 60,000 speakers are uh, thought to be left. Uh, these, the, uh, these in all likelihood will be wildly conservative estimations, and all speakers will obviously be bilingual as well. Owing to France's socio-political history of uh, pursuing policies that would engender uh, societal monolingualism, Franco-Provençal is but a portion of a much larger picture of language obsolescence. Uh, most regional languages that aren't sufficiently distinguishable from French tend to do rather poorly. Uh, conversely, over the border in Switzerland, Franco-Provençal is much more visible uh, as multilingualism is safeguarded by the constitution. There hasn't been the level of decline that uh, we see in France. So here, Franco-Provençal is still part of everyday life in places like the Canton of Valais, uh, where numbers are estimated to sit at around uh, 16,000 thereabouts. In Italy, we find the, most, uh, uh, find the greatest concentration of speakers by a proportion of total uh, population, uh, particularly in the Aosta Valley, uh, one of the handful of remaining areas where intergenerational mother tongue transmission still takes place. For this reason, Aosta is uh, seen very much as an idyllic citadel, if you like, for remaining speakers in the eyes of most native speakers that I've met over the years during the course of my fieldwork. Aside from Aosta then, however, in, and in general, Franco-Provençal can accurately be described as undergoing uh, what Camel Lamont will call gradual death, as speaker numbers have, been, uh, ha have by and large been in terminal decline for some time. 
Uh, in terms of uh, policy, provisions for Franco-Provençal are, uh, are, are non-existent in France, where it was only recognized by the Ministry for Culture and Communication uh, in 1999 as a, lang a langue de France, a language of France. Part of the reason for this is France's continued resistance to ratifying the Charter for Regional Minority Languages, which it is claimed would fundamentally conflict with uh, the French Constitution. Therein it says, uh, la langue de la République, uh, c'est le français. The language of the Republic is French. In Switzerland, uh, multi uh, multilingualism is safeguarded by Article 116 of the Constitution, which stipulates that German, French, Italian, and Romance are the regional languages of Switzerland, whereas German, French, and Italian are official languages of the Confederation. This differentiation between regional languages on the one hand and official languages on the other has important implications, obviously, for the level of prestige associated with uh, the former. For example, Romance is not an official language, and therefore it cannot be employed in parliament, in administration, in the judicial process, or in secondary or higher education. Interestingly, Franco-Provençal is distinctively absent from the article, and therefore has no official status, as it were, at all. That being said, Article 4 does guarantee that the right to express oneself in one's own language is one of the rights of man, and that no one can be discriminated on these grounds. Therefore, while provision for Franco-Provençal uh, provisions are not I explicitly guaranteed by Swiss Federation, there is uh, a much greater tolerance towards linguistic diversity in Switzerland in general. Uh, further, the individual Swiss cantons have significant autonomous oversight when it comes to regional languages. In the case of the Canton of Valais, uh, where vitality of Franco-Provençal is much higher than anywhere else in Switzerland, provisions are afforded uh, by the regional council. Moreover, unlike in France, Switzerland has no laws forbidding, uh, forbidding Franco-Provençal in the public domain or in the media, and television programs with components on Franco-Provençal are regularly found on channels like uh, Canal 9. Uh, Franco-Provençal is spoken in several regions of Italy, and thanks to uh, a number of laws, it is guaranteed some protection and provision. However, speakers of Franco-Provençal uh, number in the hundreds outside of the Aosta Valley, uh, it's only in the Alster Valley where it is found in schools and even then only at primary level. Broadly then, Franco-Provençal status uh, transnationally can be described at best as uh, ambiguous. In all its guises though, there is no accepted orthographical norm and where Franco-Provençal is written, it is found most commonly in highly localized phonetic spelling systems as, as some might expect. Uh, as just uh, uh, historically as a distinctive and coherent grouping, Franco-Provençal has traditionally commanded little acceptance in the uh, acceptance in the Romance literature generally. It was first proposed by an Italian linguist in 1878, who attempted to demarcate these varieties principally on the grounds of just one phonolog phonological feature: uh, the change in vocalic quality of Latin tonic free a in certain contextually conditioned uh, instances. So. These isoglosses bunched up here, separating uh, Franco-Provençal from Northern French. Here, Franco-Provençal uh, uh, um, maintains Latin tonic free A, whereas in many of the varieties found in uh, the, the Languedoc area, uh, you get a uh, shift up to an E or an E sound. So something like uh, pré in French would have its equivalent in Franco-Provençal, pra. Uh, the bunching of isoglosses down here, conversely, we find a raising of Latin tonic free A, which differentiates it from the, uh, from the Occitan varieties. So uh, in a context such as uh, vache, uh, a cow, you get something like vachi or vafi in Franco-Provençal, uh, whereas uh, Latin tonic free A is maintained um, in, in the Occitan varieties. So principally on the grounds of just one phonological feature, uh, the, the, these, these, this grouping was proposed and has since uh, not really been accepted. Uh, as a result of this very narrow definition, the demarcation of these varieties has traditionally been considered uh, illegitimate and repeatedly called into question. Uh, there has traditionally been little overall acceptance on what exactly Franco-Provençal is or how it can be defined. For linguists, then, the legitimacy and borders of these varieties uh, has long been the subject of some debate, and this debate has largely entirely bypassed speakers themselves, obviously, uh, who have um, never knowingly felt to be part of uh, the same larger linguistic unit, and it is often the claim that there is little overall sense of uh, linguistic identity. The label, this, this label Franco-Provençal as a scientific construct means little, if anything, to these speakers, which suggests some sort of uh, French-Provençal uh, hybrid. As such, it's an entirely common finding amongst uh, traditional speakers of Franco-Provençal 
that they have only ever known their language in an entirely affectionate way, of course, as, as Petwa. And where there is uh, instead uh, an emphasis on, on the ultra-local. Um, highly localized variation is, is the obsessive interest of, of these traditional speakers, as, as um, Dorian once said, I think it was. Um, so these, these traditional native speakers then have no interest in, in long-term preservation, um, I, I found in my own field work, if it means some, some sort, some form of standardization that, that they're vehemently opposed to. This attitude towards revitalization can be contrasted with emerging new speakers in the region who uh, take a very, very different view. So uh, just a quick word on the notion of the new speaker then. I'm sure we're all uh, here familiar at least with Nancy Dorian's work on the proficiency continuum of speakers where in the early 80s she posited three categories of speaker that could be mapped to a, a client of obsolescence. Uh, these were older, older fluent speakers, younger fluent speakers, and semi-speakers. Uh, as some sort of linguistic attrition is often said to be characteristic of semi-speakers, this latter category is viewed conventionally as uh, potential harbingers of, of language death in, in Alexandra Yaffa's work. Uh, building on the work of Dorian and others, new speakers are a novel category of speaker that has been the subject of a uh, pretty significant study most recently. Uh, there's even a European Cooperation in Science and Technology uh, focus group dedicated to new speaker research and what they can bring to uh, endangered uh, language communities. Uh, these speakers then, Alexandra Yaffas describes as evoking an upward movement away from language shift rather than an inevitable downward slope. Studies that have taken place on these speakers most recently tend to describe them invariably as predominantly middle class, uh, well-educated, urban dwelling, highly politicized. In sharp contrast to traditional native speakers, these individuals typically acquire the minority language as an intellectual exercise rather than via the home. Owing to the fact that these speakers can produce variants that are far removed from traditional norms, there is a certain amount of linguistic insecurity uh, that is reported between both native speakers and new speakers. These so-called new speakers of Franco-Provençal are now beginning to emerge out of a revitalization movement with a number of goals orientated towards more favorable language planning policies, which they wish to achieve by seeking out a more global linguistic identity for the region, wider recognition, increased literacy. In stark contrast to traditional native speakers, these individuals tend to be middle class, as I've said, well-educated, highly politicized individuals. Moreover, quite unlike native speakers who form dense, close-knit networks, uh, these speakers are geographically dispersed and maintain contact amongst themselves predominantly uh, over the internet, aside from the few occasions where they meet for the purpose of language activism. Uh, therefore, their networks might be said to be characteristically weak. In an attempt to forge a more distinctive pan-regional identity, the new speakers that I refer to here have rebaptized their language under the alternative label Arpitan which they argue is less confusing than the label Franco-Provençal, which, as I've said, simply suggests a mix of both uh, French and Provençal. Uh, this is even satirized on social media platforms among the, the, the more active members. The label Harpitan is actually borrowed from a Marxist group called the Harpitani uh, movement from the Ulster Valley in the 70s, whose original manifesto, too, curiously enough, also alludes to linguistic unification of the region. Unlike the vast majority of traditional speakers then, these Arpitanists see a common unity in the dialects of the region and they campaign actively to diffuse this term as widely as possible, along with a proposed unified multi-dialectal orthography uh, termed reference orthography B, which is viewed by Arpitanists as vital to the future of the language. However, this orthography has been heavily criticized by both speakers and linguists in the region for its oversimplification and arbit arbitrary selection of forms, which often, it is argued, will not represent a large number of Franco-Provençal varieties. OIB is not based on any one prestige variety, nor is it all accepting uh, as prescribed by the concept of polynomia, for example, as tried and tested on the island of Corsica. It instead foregrounds etymology among its most important criteria for variant selection and it is heavily influenced by standard French. It's also noteworthy that Arpitan speakers will advocate that they do not seek pan-regional linguistic standardization and are happy to tolerate variation so long as orthographic conventions are followed. It, interestingly, however, we find in, OR, uh, in ORB a set of recommended pronunciations for non-native speakers who seek a standard 
uh, Franco-Provençal pronunciation. Is this then standardization proper by the back door? So let's take an example. Um, how does ORB deal with uh, a linguistic feature such as uh, L palatalization? So a feature that has a very wide array of possible surface forms in Franco-Provençal. Uh, so in short, L palatalization refers to the palatalization of lateral approximants in onset cl uh, consonant clusters containing an initial obstruent plus lateral segment. While L palatalization is not uncommon in Romance, we find in Franco-Provençal a large amount of highly localized uh, phonological variation. How then does ORB approach this particular feature? In short, it prescribes a palatal lateral approximant as the recommended pronunciation, which is represented by the grapheme, uh, to a double L grapheme. And this variant is recommended for all five obstruent plus lateral clusters. Interestingly, the author justifies this choice because it's supposedly the, the majority pronunciation in Franco-Provençal. However, even a cursory examination of dialectal atlases for uh, any number of Franco-Provençal regions in France, at least, suggests that this is not the case. Uh, this is significant if we consider that the greatest number of Franco-Provençal speakers come from the French side. It's also significant that the authors have arbitrarily selected a, vari a variant that uh, comes from uh, the Aosta Valley, largely. As I said, Aosta is lauded in the FP, the, the Franco-Provençal communities, as the, the citadel of, of the language. And it's noteworthy that most speakers would sooner align their own linguistic practices uh, with those speakers of the Aosta Valley than they would uh, dialect speakers just a few kilometers up the road. And this is a finding that I've found time and time and again in, in, during my field work, um, that they, they would much sooner align their practices with those of Aosta than they would with their neighbor. So to summarize, on, uh, on the one hand, we find, we find in the context of Franco-Provençal a traditional native speaker base in terminal decline. Uh, these speakers we have seen have never knowingly felt to be part of the same linguistic unit. There is an obsessive interest in highly localized variation and standardization is fiercely opposed. On the other, we find an emerging group of uh, new speakers who favor instead a pan-regional linguistic identity and a, a multi-dialectal orthographical norm. Uh, and we've seen that this, uh, this, this norm proposes a series of standard Franco-Provençal pronunciations. Next, we shift our attention to actual language use, where we will be asking what these disparate speakers actually do. In particular, we will ask in which direction do new speakers move towards native speakers, uh, uh, towards native speaker variants, or towards something else. Uh, we can also ask what native speakers uh, themselves do. Uh, is there an awareness of ORB? Uh, does it carry any prestige in the native speaker community? Uh, do they continue to maintain highly localized forms that is so characteristic of Franco-Provençal? These are, these are also possible questions. So first, just a quick uh, word on methodology. In France, I conducted field work in the regions of Le Mont du Lyonnais, which forms part of the département of uh, Rhône-Alpes. Uh, the fieldwork sites are all peri-urban and converge on the city of Lyon, France's so-called second city. Uh, as regional dialect levelling is now widely reported in most northern French cities, change in a major conurbation like Lyon might well be expected. I also conducted fieldwork in the Canton Valley in Switzerland. Uh, similar to the Lyon context, Valley is made up of a number of isolated rural communities, though incredibly mountainous. Uh, that will converge on a, a regional centre of some description, Sion. However, today I'll be focusing uh, primarily on, on, the, on the Lyonnais data. So speech samples were collected from three categories of, uh, of speakers uh, with very different acquisition routes. Uh, in France, 16 native speakers were sampled who had acquired Franco-Provençal through intergenerational mother tongue transmission. Uh, two late speakers were also sampled who had acquired Franco-Provençal later in life, uh, but still in the family setting. And lastly, three new speakers uh, were included who fit the profile that we've been describing. Uh, all three were university educated, had acquired Franco-Provençal in a purely educational context. This sampling methodology was then applied to the Swiss fieldwork sites as well. Uh, so to elicit both monitored and unmonitored speech styles, I conducted semi-structured sociolinguistic interviews with speakers individually and in L1, L2 mixed groups. For the individual interviews, structured elicitation tasks were included, uh, uh, which uh, were, were constituted word lists, uh, reading passages. 
uh, composed in both uh, a traditional uh, Franco-Provençal dialect um, orthography and ORB, this, this new norm. Owing to the small size and relative social homogeneity of the communities we're talking about, I also elicited uh, sociometric data uh, by uh, essentially asking um, the speakers about their daily associations to, in attempt to try and map their, their network to, to some degree. Um, so while, while this wasn't, strictly speaking, a social network study proper, it, it was used in an attempt to try and enhance the analysis of variance. So for, for the Leonia community, which we'll be focusing on here, essentially this, uh, this, this is a depiction of the network with the, the data that I had at the time. And it maps them in terms of their primary associations with each other, how often they see each other, uh, how often they talk to each other, and so on. And essentially, these, these three highlighted speakers here are the new speakers who sit outside of the, of the larger network. Uh, this, this late speaker here also uh, had very limited contact with um, with the, the larger network too. So mostly here we've got all native speakers who uh, were able to name each other in interview and essentially this is how I also ended up recruiting my participants as per uh, the work done by Leslie Milroy and, and people since. So for our dependent factor, we'll be looking at one of the phonological variables from my PhD, which we've already mentioned, so variation in the realization of L-palatalization in Franco-Provençal. As I've said, in Franco-Provençal, L-palatalization can in theory occur in all five possible obstruent plus lateral clusters, which is common uh, particularly in varieties spoken in parts of Switzerland, uh, the Haute Savoie and places like that, where numerous highly localized variants are attested in the literature. However, this is not the case for a large area of the, of the, on the French side, um, where instead we very often tend only to find palatalization in the Vila plus lateral clusters. So, for the Lyonnais, uh, the, the Lyonnais sites, uh, the 1950s atlas data that we have tells us that L-palatalization should only take place in the Vila plus lateral sets and not in the labial sets. These data come from uh, Pierre Gardet's uh, Atlas uh, Linguistique et Ethnographique du Lyonnais, where map points uh, 40, 41, 42 correspond, correspond uh, more or less closely to, to my own field work sites, though, though not exactly. So. Uh, these aren't exactly the same locations, so uh, really this is more of an approximation. As we can see, the expected variant according to the atlas for L-palatalization is the median approximant, or yod, uh, in the velar sets, and a clear lateral approximant in the labial sets. So, on to my own data. Uh, of the 1,300 or so tokens in the corpus for L, 439 were elicited in all five obstruent plus lateral clusters for all three speaker types and across all styles in Le Monde du Lyonnais. Uh, I should stress, however, that the data are very fragmentary as there are unequal numbers of speakers in each fieldwork site. Uh, there were very few females, unfortunately, that I could sample uh, in general in these areas and not all speakers could uh, sit both the group interviews and the structured elicitation tasks, given the age and frailty of, of many of them um, um, at the time. So rigid statistical modeling of these data is therefore very difficult, and these methodological issues are not uncommon in obsolescent dialect settings uh, such as this. Some caution is therefore again needed in deriving conclusions from these data. So, Recall that um, we uh, expect palatalization in the velar clusters, but not in the labials. To give us some idea of what these sound like, uh, I uh, had some clips here that I wanted to play. So this is a, a male native speaker. Look your shit. So a straightforward um, velar plus yod. Yes. And then female. Yes. So the data reveal then that among the native speakers, we find zero palatalization in the labial sets, just as the historical evidence suggested. These speakers are therefore maintaining the distinction between velar and, and labial clusters. However, if we focus on the data from the, lab the velar sets, we do not find categorical palatalization, but instead a 50-50 split between the median approximants and the lateral approximants, which requires uh, a, a bit of discussion. 
In short, however, the data didn't show any patterning according to the macro level social variables such as sex or, or age, which isn't at all surprising given the relative social homogeneity of the community under investigation, as I suggested. Um, however, the style of the uh, speech event did flag up as having a possible interaction. So the graph here gives overall frequencies, just raw frequencies in the VLA sets only, and shows on the x-axis the field work sites explored in the study, uh, with the graph faceted by uh, speech style, so casual speech and structured elicitation tasks. Uh, first, we can see that uh, this is a low frequency variable in the casual style, but there are nearly no palatalized tokens at all. Conversely, for the word list, we find much greater frequency of palatalized tokens. However, we also find unpalatalized laterals in these clusters too. Therefore, when these L1 speakers are monitoring their speech, we get a higher rate of palatalized tokens, but with significant variation. Uh, and when there is less monitoring, palatalization drops to near zero. In terms of an explanation for this, the most obvious one would be to suggest that there is some convergence taking place with standard French, where L does not undergo palatalization before an obstruent. This limited data that I do have here would appear to support this, as we find that those sites found closest to the Loire, the periphery of the Franco-Provençal speaking zone, uh, show much lower palatalization rates. Though, uh, again, the saint symphorien uh, fieldwork site here on the far left, the data only come from two speakers. So, I mean, this is at best tentative stuff. Turning to the late speaker data, uh, as just two males uh, were, were sampled and only a very small number of tokens were elicited, we can't really make much of this. But it's noteworthy, or uh, nonetheless noteworthy, that uh, late speakers show similar patterns with their reference group. In other words, palatalization in the labials with some variation in the, uh, sorry, no palatalization in the labials, but some palatalization in the velas. It's in the new speaker data um, where we can make some particularly interesting uh, observations. So first, like both, um, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, like the, both the native and, and late speakers, we can observe the use of both the lateral approximant and the median approximant in the velar clusters. In this sense, then, they produce similar forms to the native and late speakers. Secondly, while the token numbers remain small, we can observe that the new speakers are the only category to extend palatalization from velar sets to labials, unlike the native speakers and the late speakers sampled for uh, this region. So in this case, they, they, they differ. However, what is perhaps most interesting is that we find in the data a number of palatalized lateral tokens as well. Behind that, I think. There we go. OK. Uh, so a, a number of palatalized lateral tokens too. Um, so just to uh, try and give the difference here between the two. So this is a male uh, L1 speaker for a VLA set, as we heard previously. Look, Josh. And then a uh, voiced equivalent. Yes. And then the uh, palatalized lateral. Look, Josh. So a distinct difference in, in uh, the palatalization. Gliasi. So gliasi, gliasi. Uh, moreover, when the new speaker data are broken down further by individual participants, we can see that the palatalized laterals come from just one speaker in the Lyonnais sample overall, participant A1823. Uh, in addition, the palatalized variants only occur in the elicitation tasks, and no tokens were recorded in group interviews, much uh, like the native speakers. So what reasoning can we advance for the emergence of this palatalized reflex in the data? We could argue that this might be an example of uh, what Peter Trudgill has called an interdialectal form. After all, this speaker has standard French as an L1, where palatalization in this context does not occur. And the dialectal feature for this region we have seen is the median approximant. Alternatively, we could argue that this form has come about in the data as a result of some influence from the ORB orthography. Recall that the palatal lateral approximant has been selected as the recommended pronunciation for this variable. 
While I'm not obviously making the claim here that the palatal lateral and the palatalized lateral are the same thing, uh, we might argue that A1823 is distantiating himself from the dialectal form for this area and for lack of a palatal lateral approximant phoneme in the speaker's phonological inventory uh, has produced instead a phone that to this speaker might approximate more towards an arpitant norm. Recall that as a new speaker, this individual employs Francoprovençal far more frequently in the written form and therefore ORB may be having some impact linguistically. To try to account for this, I devised an uh, Arpitan engagement index on the basis of six indicators that might show how strongly these speakers are connected to a larger revitalization movement and how this might relate to language use. So the factors were uh, labels their variety as Franco-Provençal or Arpitan rather than Patois, acquired Franco-Provençal in an educational setting, uh, reads Franco-Provençal literature from other regions, uses Franco-Provençal on the internet, and engages in language activism uh, and participates in, crucially, the Arpitan movement itself. Those speakers scoring in a range of five to six for uh, the, uh, these indicators would suggest very strong level of engagement. Again, although the data are very fragmentary and limited, we have some tentative evidence that suggests that engagement in the Arpitan movement might be acting as a reinforcement mechanism, or rather an enforcement mechanism, for what these speakers see as an alternative norm. Table six is showing here that only those new speakers that scored between five and six have produced palatalized laterals or palatalized in the labial plus lateral sets, something that again, we wouldn't have expected for this region. Uh, by way of some conclusion then, we've seen that quite unlike France's other regional languages, Franco-Provençal has long been viewed as an illegitimately demarcated notion by linguists and speakers than, uh, speaker numbers have been dwindling for some time. We've seen some evidence to data suggest that linguistic convergence might be taking place among the traditional native speakers in the direction of the dominant language. However, I've also suggested that emerging new speakers might well stem the flow of language shift. These highly politicized individuals have adopted a novel approach to revitalization by effectively rebranding the language for themselves. In an attempt to recreate a pan-regional arpitant identity, um, uh, as, as an approach. They also support a multi-dialectal orthography that interestingly does not necessarily adopt variants of the widest currency. I try to demonstrate with very limited data here that these individuals are capable of producing variants that can diverge quite drastically from traditional norms. In the case of the variable discussed today, by examining these speakers' associations and, participating, and participation in the Arpitan movement, I've suggested that an alternative norm might emerge over time and so these very few tokens might better be described in Peter Treadgill's terms as vestigial uh, variants, representing the early seeds of change, which might indeed come to be a norm in the future, particularly given uh, the uh, obsolescence of the language and uh, assuming that um, numbers of native speakers can grow from this particular movement. Thank you very much. Sorry, I don't quite follow. <coughs> the forms which are produced by ministers, yeah. how are they evaluated? Oh, evaluated, right, sorry, excuse me. Um, so I, I found a, an interesting context. I mean, I know I didn't speak about the, the Swiss sites today, uh, but between the French and, and the Swiss side, um, in my interviews with the uh, FP speakers on the French side, there wasn't really much reaction at all because there wasn't really much contact between the two. Uh, as I said, uh, based on the data, when native speakers and new speakers came together, and by the way, that was really difficult to work, to, to get to actually work, um, uh, new speakers didn't produce these features, uh, but interestingly, native speakers, as the data suggests, didn't palatalize at all either. So uh, I've suggested that this might be a stage in phonological leveling because it seems to be sensitive to, to style in some way. Um, on the Swiss side, there was much more contact between new speakers and native speakers, but there was also 
a significant um, stigmatization of new speaker forms. Uh, so in, in an article that I've, I, I'm, um, I've just submitted to, to uh, general multilingual, what is it, multilingualism, multicultural development, uh, I argue that uh, on the Swiss side, the, the, because, they, because they are so protective of highly localized variation, they are unwilling to, uh, or, or they're, they're unwilling to accept not only new variants and new practices, but new speakers in general. I found significant reticence between the two groups. They were very much, as uh, Bernadette O'Rourke says, uh, sociolinguistically incompatible in that sense. The, the, the interview recordings, the qualitative data were, were very revealing in that sense, that they weren't prepared to accept new speaker practices, new norms. They don't tolerate mistakes. And really, they, the, it was interesting because they said that they would much rather that they didn't try. You know, it's like they want to be the ones that nail the last nail in the coffin, as it were, which, which is bizarrely paradoxical, but I'm sure relevant to many other obsolescent language contexts. Yeah, quite right. <laughs> quite right, yeah. But uh, that, that wasn't, uh, I didn't find any of this on, on the French side, interestingly. Now, I wonder if that's because the tip towards uh, shift is, is so much further along the line than in the Swiss side, where there's still relative vitality, and you get, you know, I was astonished going into the Swiss sites after the French sites, finding speakers in the street. Where, you know, whereas in France, I spent a lot of time trying to get into these communities and recruit participants. So on the Swiss side, it was much more, it was much more vitality. On the French side, there really wasn't. And it is very much in terminal decline. And I do wonder whether that played a factor, that played a part, sorry, in, in the difference between the two. Uh, I didn't do any uh, data collection for this on, on the Valdos side. That's part of a project that hopefully I'll get funding for coming up. But as I said, in Aosta, uh, the this, this situation again is very different. Uh, the, this the great, you find the greatest number of speakers per total regional population. You find it in schools. There's to some degree regional norms. Uh, and there's intergenerational mother tongue transmission. So I would imagine that on the Aosta side, things are very different. So th this is what makes it a particularly interesting, I think, sociolinguistic complex, uh, context because you have a, a, an endangered language that is spoken across these free states and it, things are being played out very differently. So I would imagine and I would expect things to be very different on that side too. Um, so that's to come, basically. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a, there's a particularly interesting one in the case of Franco Provençal because in the Savoie region, which is sort of part of the French side, you have the, the, these militant movements called um, things like Savoie Libre, you know, Free Savoy. And, you know, and they see um, in, in these isolated areas this, this common language and this common ethnicity, if you like, and, and, the, and they militate for, you know, separation from the state and to have their language put into, into schools and things like that. And I would imagine that there's there isn't much of an, uh, a willingness to accept that they're part of a larger unit, actually. And architanists that I've spoken to in contact with people from places like Savoie seem to suggest this, you know, that they're punting this alpine identity. And, you know, some people are like, well, hang on, that's not us. So you, you get these interesting dynamics emerging from that. Yes. So it, it was proposed by um, an academic, obviously a linguist, who um, was himself from the region. Uh, he wrote uh, an iteration of it, ORA, uh, which he published in 98. And it was sort of adopted in the early 2000s by, by this movement that I refer to. Uh, it was then obviously built on for ORB, which formed part of his doctoral thesis at uh, Paris Set, I think. Um, so it, it, it's one of those, it's very similar to the Breton context in many ways in that you've got a norm that's being adopted by an academic elite that's being propagated here. You know, it's not come from the people, as it were. And as I said, there is massive opposition to it when you get down to speakers on the ground. And this is something that they're trying to push against. But I do, this is, yeah, this is, this is what I mean, yeah. So they're, they're, you, you increasingly find these clashes at sort of regional dialect festivals that, that take place annually. They come together, and you get the, these, these, these oppositions, as it were, in this discourse. It's, it's quite fascinating. But yeah, effectively, ORB is an academic construct, if you like, that, that has been used. There's some understanding on the part of the movement that uses it that this language is going to go if we don't do something about it. So they're willing to 
to, to tolerate variation as, I were, as, as it were, as long as people stick to the written medium. But as I've said, if they're going to punt a standard pronunciation by the back door as well, it's not really honest, I guess. ORB? No, far from it, no. Um, it only really is used by uh, language militants that belong to this Zerpitan movement, if you were. But it's interesting that they tend to be the loudest ones, because if you go online, for example, this is where you find the majority of them. And you find interesting situations where Zerpitan is now quite prominent on places like Wikipedia. Ethnologue no longer use Franco-Provençal as a, as a label. They use Zerpitan. So where, where they're loudest is online, and that appears to be leading to some kind of change in that respect. Uh, the only others that I, I've... Yeah, okay, so in terms of new speakers, no. So the only other context that I can think of from my particular field work is uh, when I was doing field work in, in, uh, in Valais, I found this, uh, this opposition, uh, the competing communities of new speaker practices, if you like, in that um, either you belonged to this, this, this um, movement that propagates ORB, believes in this notion of Arpitan, this wider identity, or you believe very firmly in what's local. So some new speakers actually adopt the views of the native speakers and they're quite happy to say, you know, I'm not interested in anything else. I learned this because it's part of me. It's part of my local community and that's what I want to learn. I think my, my younger speaker was, was 19 and I, I had her on record as suggesting this, which suggests that, yeah, new speakers aren't, they're not like a homogenous unit of their own. You get a lot of these, these interesting um, dichotomies taking place, I suppose, within, within that notion of new speakerism, I guess. Okay, yeah, so uh, from what perspective? So as I said, in Ulster, things uh, are slightly different because it's an autonomous region and this is where the greatest number of speakers are. El do you mean elsewhere in Italy? Like in Fauto and Celdevito, places like that? Because you, you, it's spoken in different sort of dis uh, distant and disparate places, um, even northern Italy or southern Italy. Uh, outside of Ulster, speakers number in the hundreds. Um, and... I've not done any field work there. That's an interesting question, actually. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, certainly in Ulster, as I've suggested, the context is, is again, rather different. And I'm wondering, like, um, because you've got the uh, like the uh, government yeah. entities, each other, that's a polite way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's polite still, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's certainly possible. Um, I would suggest that the, the militants that, that I'm talking about here are actually more active on the ground in Switzerland where they don't have that problem. So um, um, the, the network data that I had for Switzerland suggested that new speakers were more integrated in the local communities, were more active on the ground, as it were, um, than they were in France. Um, so I wouldn't suggest that that's actually a factor. Je suis pas de la région. Non. So how did you find the speakers? Because you were, you know, you went to Switzerland, you went to France, yeah. and they are, you know, you dispersed this all over. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you find them? The new speakers, the old speakers? Okay, yeah. I mean, I don't know looking back how I did that. Uh, I I think what to start, I mean, I started working on these communities in 2010 while I was a master's student. Um, and at that time, I relied very heavily on colleagues at uh, Université Lyon 2 who uh, work on these communities as well, and that was an entry point, as it were. Um, and I kind of I went from there, basically. Uh, a couple of students were at what I called at the time neo-locuteurs, so new speakers too. So 
Um, once I sort of met a few and I started asking them about their associations with others, it was quite easy to get into the communities. Transport was a massive issue. Um, can't get anywhere really in Valley in a car, uh, sorry, on a bus, you, you, you need to drive around. So in terms of accessing the communities, I relied on, on local dialect associations, on, on universities uh, who are quite active in these communities. Um, and I went from there basically. And the, the same in Switzerland? Yeah, well, Switzerland was slightly easier, as I said. You could walk around the street and hear Franco Port. It was, it was bizarre, I wasn't used to it at all. Uh, well, yeah, well, I mean, you, you, you joke, but I remember this vividly this occasion where I was walking around with one of my new speakers and, and there was a situation where we were sort of in the road and there were these, these, um, these artisan workers sort of drinking wine. And we sort of went up to them. And often in Valais, if you have someone's last name, that's enough to get you very far because they have like seven last names and that's it. I'm not sure why. Um, and that, that was a lot easier from, from that perspective. Getting participants in France was much, much harder because they're, they're so isolated. You know, you can only get a bus that gets to these communities like twice a day. Uh, it was a lot more difficult. But no, I couldn't have done this without, you know, the, the early on the efforts of uh, Lyon 2 and, and local dialect associations that uh, were quite happy to accommodate me. So thanks to them, I guess. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is sort of part of, of ongoing research, as it were, in the wider sort of new speaker network community of academics that are interested in these sorts of things. I mean, I can only really talk from my own experiences. Some feel a, a sense of attachment to this, this larger unit because they come from some part of the area, not necessarily from the community itself, but some part of the area. Others feel disdain at the fact that this language hasn't been passed down to them and therefore feel like that they, they need to take it up, that they should. Uh, there, there are a, w a wide number of reasons why one might adopt uh, an endangered language as a new speaker. Um, academic interest um, is another one that's been cited. So varied and, and complex. What sort of advice would you give to people who <laughs> the higher the fluency. <laughs> uh, yeah, I could believe that. I mean, especially in sort of Switzerland where the communities are so difficult to get to. I, I mean, I remember at one point driving through a vineyard, something that felt fairly vertical. Um, that, that's, I wouldn't be surprised because they're so isolated. I mean, some, I mean it's astonishing. I mean, I guess as a, as a, a young scholar trying to to do this sort of thing, you, you don't expect in this day and age that that's going to be a problem, and it is, um, in terms of access, I mean. So some of these communities where, uh, where some other speakers came from, especially in Switzerland, you found the most interesting characters, yeah, the, the, not, I don't know about the highest, but certainly the, the hardest to get to, yeah, yeah, definitely. Sure, yeah, I mean, I, I would imagine that there's something to be said for that, definitely, yeah. Did you think that they understand each other? So the, I mean, I'm not maybe they never met and then I get your point, but they would understand each other. Who's they? Oh, right, so... From France, right. from, and from Switzerland. Right. I mean, is it the same variety of Franco-Provençal? Je dirais non. Uh, so uh, the, the literature suggests that in some cases, yes, in some cases, no, but it's never really clear. I haven't done any research myself on how mutually intelligible these things are. Um, I'm talking about a, a study further down the line on dialectometrics to try and work out in some scientific way how mutually intelligible they are. Speakers, like I said, depends very much on who you ask. Very often there's an unwillingness to understand their neighbor, you know, neighbor opposition, that sort of thing is probably part of it. But how about you, when you, you did some field work in France? Yeah. Then you went to Switzerland. Yeah. Yeah. Could you, could you just use it in Switzerland? Oh, right. So in terms of my... Ex well, no. Uh, no, not at all. I mean, these varieties... So from my perspective as an L2 speaker, these things are wildly different and incredibly complicated. And I was banging my head against the wall on a number of occasions uh, because, uh, as I said, part of my methodology was I'd get them speaking individually and then in groups. 
So very often in groups, you've got to be the one to direct the conversation. So you want to do your best to try and speak en uh, patois, si tu veux. Um, that took some tuning of the ear. And, and I was grateful once I'd met some of my participants that were happy to sort of do the directing and me sort of sit, sit in the background. So no, when I was trying to acquire, or, or even passively, some, some knowledge of FP in Switzerland, uh, it took a lot of work. Um, I don't know whether native speakers would say that they're mutually intelligible. Those that I've asked have said no, but there's no real scientific data either way. So, so it would not be right to, to talk about Franco Provencal and put them all in the same. Well, that's an interesting question. that's an interesting question. You know, do do you do you demarcate uh, borders for the for, for this language uh, based on you know just one phonological feature that happens to fit? Mm -hmm. uh, that that's a very good question. You know, who are these borders for? I mean, this is something that James Costa and Michel Bert have talked about at some length. Um, so, I mean, the jury's out on that one, you know, as far as, as, far as I'm concerned. It's a difficult one to, to, to get one's head around. Right, right. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask more about the, the, the new speakers you're taking from? Okay. Uh, the okay, right. So, the new speakers that I met in Lyon uh, were taking uh, evening classes that were offered by a local dialect association. Um, interestingly, those classes didn't take place with, um, liter uh, with pedagogy that was written with ORB. Um, when I'd come back, so I did my first battlefield work in 2010. When I came back, I'd learned that both, um, so two of the new speakers that I met in 2010 had since stopped the classes and have taken things on by themselves. Uh, on the Swiss side, uh, it was a combination of, um, again, associations putting out pedagogy written locally that they could pick up and learn for themselves. These things, uh, as I said, amongst new speakers take place predominantly online anyway. Um, so I guess it's as one would teach oneself a language um, by, a, you know, by themselves in, in, in a number of cases. These, you know, this, the criteria is it's not passed down intergenerationally. So there's some educational context or some pursuit that's academic. Are there? Um, on the French side, I, I found it very difficult to come up with any, to, to find any material myself. I mean, this, the, the, there, there isn't a lot at all. On the Swiss side, you've got more active um, dialect associations that put out literature, that spend money, that get some money from the regional council, like I've said, because of their approach to multilingualism. So that there is some. Um, and where there is some, you often find sort of younger speakers taking up these classes out of interest, but it's facultative, it's not, it's not part of the curriculum, the national curriculum in any way, um, so it's optional. don't know if that answers your question. Okay. Okay. So in my in yeah, it's it's. A, I know. I mean, I wasn't making the suggestion that they were fluent speakers. The the the, the fluency is extremely variable. Uh, they tend to be a lot more uh, competent in writing than they are in, in in spoken, which is why I had such a hard time getting new speakers and and native speakers together in the same room. Um, but. In my group interviews, I found that the new speakers were able to, you know, produce, um, you know, ha have, engage in a discussion. Uh, whatever you'd call it, fluent, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure what, what fluent would mean in that context. But um, so then you need to establish what? Would I need to establish fluency? Well, if you're going to study well, the yeah, I mean, I, I was interested in, in very specific features, and I don't think you necessarily need fluency to, to, to make the kind of suggestion that, that I'm making here that um, a potential putative learner norm is having some impact on, on oral fluency uh, when they're the ones using it in writing, if you see what I'm saying. So in interview, I felt that they were producing coherent Franco Provencal as, as I understood it. Uh, and the variable that I was interested in was being elicited. So that was enough of a leap for me. Any kind of discrepancy, mm -hmm. uh, um, a 
Mm. Well, n not. Um, yeah, I, I can see that that's a problem, um, and that's not something that I was able to tackle or deal with, but I, that's an interesting point that I take. Mm. Yeah. Um, like I said, uh, the majority of the time new speakers will be using this online, so amongst themselves, um, in the same way as you, I guess you use any other language. Um, when they come together, it's usually a specific context, usually language activism of some description, usually at a dialect association of some kind. So there are specific purposes. I mean, um, Benedict Pivot talks about the post-vernacular culture of Franco Provençal that has become more performative than anything else. Um, so yeah, limited. Yeah. Is that primarily written content or do you say still Oh, right. Uh, so um, I've been told that they do it through Skype, but I haven't seen it myself. So it's predominantly social media, actually. Yeah. So stuff like indigenous tweet, that sort of thing, uh, yeah. Facebook. That, um, they, they, there are translations that are being worked on, and you know, for Facebook, things like that. They use the ORB, uh, yeah. 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 Interestingly, they, they, it's ORB that's being punted here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Always. Oh, always, I can't tell you, always there was variability uh, in both. All I'm saying that for my data, uh, there was no palatalization whatsoever in the native speaker category. Only in the new speaker category did you find palatalization in labials. Not categorical, though. Right. So they just do it across the board. There is, there is an argument, perhaps, that it's an allergy, sure. But what's interesting is the new speakers do it, the native speakers don't. And what's also yeah, interesting is that... Them. Sorry? Well, that, that might be a possibility. I was suggesting that ORB is having some impact because in terms of, an orthog in, in terms of orthography, you get this 2L thing with all five obstruents. Um, yeah. Oh, to begin with? Well, I mean, that what you mean in terms of... Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, this is what I'm saying. So they, they've not gone for the variant of widest currency here, which by my understanding is a, is a median approximate. They've gone for something that's very like a Austin variety. Now, that's probably telling in of itself. You know, that the, the 1930s literature, I mean, this is not very well documented at all. So the 1930s literature that I've read suggests that the uh, palatal lateral approximant uh, was a feature of one or two dialects in, in Switzerland, for example, but had since been leveled out. Uh, it is still found in Aosta. So, there's probably something going on there as well. Uh, it's not a coincidence. Sorry? After the labials. Uh, after, right, so it depends. In France, you don't get palatalization at all of labials, uh, except in, 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 sorry? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the closest you get to the Swiss side, the more likely you are to find palatalization in labial sets. Oh, obviously, yeah, obviously. yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Well, what I'm saying is, if you look at the atlas data from at least the 50s, there's no palatalization in the labial sets at all, um, you know, from the, the uh, edge of the, the Lyonnais area right through to uh, the haute savoie area, which is sort of getting into almost Swiss territory there. So obviously we're talking about a dialect continuum, if you like, but there's no reason to suggest why these new speakers should be producing palatalization in labial sets. And what's interesting is the kind of variant that they opt to choose, or at least in one or two cases, isn't a yod, but it's something approximating another kind of variety. Now, is it influenced from another variety? Is it influenced from ORB as a norm? I'm saying that both are possible. But you said to do the others, it's written like that, isn't it? It's written, so yeah, so obstruent plus two L's, and they understand that that two L's means, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And where does that come from? <laughs> Generalization, I would imagine. 
because, well, what I'm arguing here is that they've cherry-picked features. So they've gone, this is a grassroots form from this part, and we quite like that variety, so we're going we're gonna to import that. It's, 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 uh, it's definitely arbitrary, definitely. And this isn't, again, unlike many other new speaker contexts that describe these sorts of phenomena. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard that one before. <laughs> well, precisely. And, if, and, and if, you, if you look at the Swiss side, where, as I was saying, they're quite prepared not to engage with new speakers at all because they're, they're not happy with new practices or they're not happy with um, errors, if you like, then you know, something's got to give at some point. Well, what are you going to do years down the line? Exactly. Well, exactly. Exactly. I know. Um, I got in touch with someone at a dialect association recently whose father passed away and he played a prominent role in a lot of my field work and that was really telling because you know these people aren't going to be around for much longer. But if they're unwilling to compromise, again this is, I mean, this is attested throughout the revitalization literature as I'm sure you know. So. Right. <laughs> well, uh, it won't be long before this is a similar context. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. <laughs>